marriage alone. She is a prophet of God true and true. Well marinated in God's word. Sound. And I have the honor tonight of bringing the prophet of God, Pastor Tammy herself. I want to with Jesus' joy receive the ministry of the co-lead pastor of Citizens of Light Church, Pastor Timmy. You know, I'm so excited to be born in these times, to be part of this generation and what God is doing. I'm so excited. This camp meeting has just made me stand in awe of God and what he's doing with us in our generation. Anybody like that here? You know, and the good news is that God, there are so many of you that God has brought you here to groom you because the next move of God is going to be bathed by you. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Somebody just lift up your hands and worship Jesus. Say thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to celebrate all the pastors. All the pastors. Um, friends, colleagues, sons and daughters. Protégés. I celebrate all the pastors. I celebrate all the pastors. I want to, you may be, you may be seated. You may be seated. Pastor Puda, thank you for that word. Thank you so much for that word. Thank you so much. Thank you for steering the atmosphere. Steering the atmosphere greatly. What an atmosphere in this place. Thank you so much for that word. Pastor Puda, I'm your real friend. <laughs> Pastor Mui, is Pastor Joyce, friend? Me, I'm your real friend. <laughs> Thank you for many years of friendship, of um, consistency, and of being who you are. We celebrate you dearly. Pastor Diola, in fact, I don't even know where to start from. Thank you for covenant friendship. Thank you for being my friend, for being my sister, for being my rock solid supporter you know i want you are that person i want to share everything with when i'm happy i want to call you and when i'm down i want to call you thank you thank you for being that friend please help me celebrate pastor Jola Jan. thank you pastor ayo okay so <laughs> There's this thing that they always say that I'm Pastor Ayo's AC. It's an inside joke, but I'll bring you into it. So, you know, when you're someone's fan, they say my own has past fan. That's who I'm his AC. Pastor Ayo, I love you, and you know it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being that friend. Thank you for being that brother. Thank you for being that Christian. Thank you so much. I love you so much. And please, while you're standing. <laughs> let me talk now. It's your shout, Suabi, because it's your pastor. But let me talk. The microphone is with me. So I was in this relationship, you know. I would talk. And I'd been with this guy for four solid years of my life. We we're planning marriage that, you know, once, I, almost like I dated him through school. And after school, we had planned that uh, we would go and save sharp, sharp, and then we would settle down. We started planning things. I was in love. 
I really was in love. That young girl that found love. And I was in love. And then, you know, it looks like the message that is even going to come to you. God came to me. I love the Lord. When I met this guy, I wasn't so into the Lord. But somehow along the line, I got so into the Lord. And I loved him with everything in me. And then the Lord spoke to me, came to me and told me, this guy cannot take you to destiny. Ah. I said, Lord, whatever it takes. I told the Lord, I said, I will pray. It will take me to destiny. <laughs> I even remember one day, my mommy went to see this prophet. And while we were, you know, at the prophet's place, my mom was telling the prophet some personal issues. I was looking at the time, wanted to eat. It was after service on Sunday. Wanted to eat, me and my friend. And I just peeped to go and hurry my mom up. And the prophet looked at me and said, come. You're in a relationship with someone. He said, that's not your husband. I looked at the prophet. What are you saying? He said, that's not your husband. I busted out and started crying. Started crying and so being uncontrollable. The prophet was so embarrassed. He said, it's okay. There's a remedy. <laughs> I'm telling you. He said, can you fast? I said, sir, I'm a fasting machine. <laughs> if it's fast, he said, if you can fast, God will turn it around. He lied to me. <laughs> that just fast. So I went on this fast. I think my mom even joined me. We all fasted. And after, he told me after the fast, he would be my husband. <laughs> but when the Lord came to meet me, the Lord said, no. I'm not going to negotiate your destiny. This is not your husband. I cried. I threw tantrums. I said, Lord, this is the person I want. The Lord said, no. This is not your husband. And then the Lord showed me a man. I've already started ministry, you know. You people like gist. The world will soon eat you, don't worry. And then the Lord told me that this is the man that will take you to destiny. He told me, he said, why are you still mourning over Saul? Knowing that I've rejected him. I've prepared for you the one that will take you to destiny. Saul is not David. Because I loved the Lord. It was just not because I loved the man at that time. Because I loved the Lord. I broke up. I broke up. I cried for one year. As in, broke up. And then eventually, the word became flesh. The same man God showed me. You know, I'm a prophet now. So if you are not, don't start expecting this. Me, I saw, I saw visions. I saw they were too spectacular. I saw everything that this is the man. I saw. I saw he, before he proposed to me in real but the day he was proposing to me, I was just looking at him like this. That welcome. I saw for over a year God showed me. I saw him. I he had asked him, he had, he had told me to marry him. He had started telling me things about everything through night vision, through other visions. I saw it. And when eventually he came and we started this journey, I understood why he couldn't have been the other fellow. Every day of my life, I've been walking into destiny. This man picked up that girl that just loved God but didn't know I left from right. He began to teach me. Almost everything I know, Apostle Muiwari taught me. The prophetic, don't do this. You know, I told you, if they have left me with the prophetic I had, this, the way it was on campus, you will have been, you'll have been bringing goats to come and hear what you will bring goats, you will slaughter it. Taught me, corrected me, trained me, built me, 
led me. I want you to celebrate with me. My archer, my pastor. If it's your pastor too. Apostle Mwewa Areo. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And um, let me just say this. A weak altar will bath a weak priest. A weak altar will bath a weak priest. Um, Pastor Ayuajani, Apostle Ayuajani, Pastor Ayuajani, you know, began to, some people don't just bear their title, but we know who they are. He's an apostle. So, you know, began, began today, he started, you know, speaking to us about the perceptions and all that, and then spoke to us about prayer. You know, that that's what sharpens your perception. That's all those perceptions is your priest that connects with that realm. And if your priest is not on top of his game, your perception will be dull. And Apostle Miwari came up and then he spoke to us again about supplication, talking about prayer. And we've been talking about how to keep the altar, you know, the prayer, your altar has to be on fire. You know, Apostle Miwari told us yesterday that your altar can be a location, a time, and instructions. I want to give you, as I just build on what they said. He said something very vital and very profound yesterday, and I'm going to build on that. He said, every altar, the people must understand the principle of sacredness and consecration. And that's what I'm going to build on. An altar is a place of consecration. There are four things that an altar is. It's a gateway into the spirit realm, a portal. Apostle Muiwari always said that yesterday, and he explained that. An altar is also a place of worship. Worship. You know, when you worship, sacrifices too are a form of worship. And Pastor Opuda taught us that, showed us different kinds of sacrifices. An altar is a place, the third thing an altar is, is a place of covenant. Covenant. Where you know, God has, there are just some places, you know, there are some, God, I know that God has caught covenant with us. I know, and Jesus is the mediator of that. But then there are also covenants that God caught with men. That because you did this, I will do this. And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand working with God. There are things you do, and because you did, God will cut a covenant with you. An altar is that place of covenant. I was reading one of Kennedy Higgins books, and he was saying that he woke up, and he just knew that his son was in danger. And you know, he began to pray to God and pray to God for the safety of that son. And eventually, God told him that he settled. And God said something to it, to him. You know, when I called you into the field ministry, and you came into the field ministry, because you answered me and came to the field ministry, I will protect your son. There are dimensions like that. I remember one day. My pastor 
had called me. I've said, for those of you in CLC, I've said that story when I was in Ibado. I was attending Harvest House. I was living in Ruyoli. And there are times I would, I don't know how to show you that distance, but it's quite a distance. One day during it, you see, when I was trying to examine the distance, someone that knew Ibado said maybe it's like from here to Yankore, kind of. And there are times I would, you know, have to trek a long distance just to get to church. And one day, my pastor called me and said, I should come and um, look after his kids for him. I said, yes, sir. What I didn't tell him was I didn't have Tife to get to his house. He was living in Akobo then. I was living in a real estate. And, but he was my pastor. I, don't, I, I, didn't, I couldn't say no. Oh, I didn't want to say no. That was our training then. And that's good training. And, you know, I said, yes, sir. I'll be there, sir. Just get it done. Don't give excuses. That was how we were trained. And, you know, I went to meet my mom. And she said, ah, that mommy, please, I need some money. And she said, ah, that she has just maybe some maybe 500 or something then. She just gave me that money. The money was going to take me, going to bring, was going to take me, bring me to somewhere, but won't bring me totally home. And you know, I got into the car to go. I went to his house. I stayed with the kids. His wife traveled. He had to go to work. I served, did everything, you know, cleaned the house, did everything. I could do for my pastor then. And when I was going, and he came back, you know, he was so impressed. I will show me. I said, yes, sir. I'm going, sir. I said, okay, God bless you. Bye-bye. And all. So when I was going, I took the cab to where the cab could take me. And then I began to trek. It was a long distance. I trekked and trekked. And as I was trekking, I wasn't complaining. I wasn't murmuring, I was rejoicing. And I was just trekking and rejoicing and singing and trekking. And when I got to the junction of Oluyole, I heard God. I heard God. God spoke to me. He said, because you have done this, all your life you will never lack your past. Oh, I rejoiced at the word. Until my life began to play out. When you talk of helpers, I always have helpers. Those that know me, those that are close to me, they know that, in fact, it's a mystery. As one person is living, several have never lacked help. And I don't have people that give me a dick. I have people that will go the length and breadth, people that can take a bullet for me, people that will do everything just to help me. So why did I say that? An altar is a place of covenant. God cuts covenant with people. Then an altar is a place of consecration. An altar is a place of consecration. And that's what I want to talk on today. A place of consecration is a place where you are emptied of self. It's a place where things die. It's a place where things live. It's a place where things die. And it's a place where things live. They are terms and conditions of every altar. Consecration is a term and condition of operating your altar as also it is an altar. Let's see Joshua 3.5 in NLT. Joshua 3.5, NLT. Look at this. He said, then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do great wonders among you. Purify yourselves. 
God is going to do great wonders among you, but it starts with you, what? Purifying yourself. Let's see Exodus 30, 30. Look at this. It says, and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. You know, we have said that, that for there to be an altar, there must be a priest. And for the priest to function effectively, there must be what? Consecration. Because of time, I want to talk to you about two kinds of consecration. Two kinds of consecration. I will speak to you about general consecration and specific consecration. Give me 2 Corinthians 6, 17 in NLT. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 in NLT. Look at this. It says, therefore, come out from among unbelievers. So that means he was talking to who? Believers. Come out from among unbelievers. And separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. Say, so listen to me. There must be a clear cut difference between a believer and an unbeliever. It must be obvious to all which side of the divide you belong to. The Bible says, let him that names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. I know that it's getting to a point whereby this kind of teaching is getting so uncommon in the body of Christ. But when it comes to your priesthood and your altar, there must be consecration. There must be a difference between those that serve God and those that don't serve God. They must see, you know, when um, Apostle was introducing Pastor Ayo, he said something. He said he's a Christian. They must be able to say about you that you are a Christian. When it comes to your altar, when it comes to the priesthood, you must come out from among unbelievers and separate yourself unto the Lord. As a priest that is worthy. You can't keep doing the same things unbelievers are doing. You can't keep doing the same things. Um, there must be a clear cut distinction. There must, people must see you and know that you're a Christian. People must see you. And know that you belong to God. People must see you and know which side of the divide exactly you belong to. What sort of a priest that you are the one we find in fornication? You stand up from the bed of fornication. And then you say things like, of course, I'm a priest. Yes, you're a priest. You are still a priest. But you are desecrating the altar. You are the, how can it be you? A priest of the Most High God. That is found in internet fraud. General consecration.
You say, and this one is just Yahoo. This is how the boys are doing it. Priest. He said, come out from unbelievers. There must be a coming out. There must be a what? Coming out. You can't look like them. You have to separate yourself. It has to be obvious the God you are serving. You have to represent that deity firsthand as his priest. Come out from among them. There's a way you must conduct yourself as a priest. When you were an unbeliever, that is how you behaved. But there must be a difference between who you used to be and who you have become now. Give me Colossians 3, 5 to 4, 10. Let's do this very quickly in NLT. Look at this. Colossians 3, 5 to 4, 10. It says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Talking to believers. Because right now in the body of Christ, you know this message, I told my husband, I was believing, thinking about what I was going to preach during um, Rivers and Wells, and I was just at the face of the Lord. And on Sunday I slept and I had a dream preaching this. I saw myself preaching this, and I told my husband, I said, this is what I saw. He said, go ahead. Because I believe there is so much God wants to do with us. But he wants us to put that thing that is, you know, he wants us to purify, to purge ourselves. To be a clean vessel so that he can pour all of himself in us. There is so much the Lord is doing with the household of CLC. But you have to come out from among them. And don't touch their filthy things. He says, so put to death the sinful, earthly things locking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality. Are you listening to me? I don't know what they've been teaching. That yes, Jesus has died for our sins, past, present, and future, so we can do whatever we like, so we can keep sinning. Did Jesus die so that you can keep sinning? Did he go, all, did he go through all of that, became sin for you, so that you can continue to sin? Even Apostle Paul said it, that can we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, certainly not. Another translation says, God forbid. Put to death the sinful, earthly things locking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. I remember back then on campus, there was this story about this particular person. A child of God. A sister in church. Who this club guy, you know, came to their church. And was looking for girls and took this sister Osha home. And took the sister Osha home. Slept with her. The club guy that slept with her began to feel bad. And he was saying within himself that. And she was like, what's the problem? He said, I don't know. I shouldn't have done this. And you know what the sister told him? Don't worry. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You need to know the part of the priesthood, the things that have been done away with and the things that are not done away with. The priest must still be pure. That is not done away with. Offering bulls and goats might have been done away with, but the purity of the priest must still be there. He must still be there. He said, 
I have nothing to do with sexual immorality. You can't be a priest. You can't, you know, you can't have that altar. You can't be a child of God. And you are the one. And I know I'm talking to someone now. Because this is a prophetic teaching. You can't be the one standing up from that bed of fornication. You can't be the one sleeping with that boy. You can't be the one sleeping with that girl. Priest, wake up. Don't be a sleeping priest. And don't be a sinning priest. Awake unto righteousness and sin not. Stop that. Stop it. Sexual immorality. Go back. Impurity. Lust. Someone says, eh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't penetrate. What we just do is, I'm still a virgin. Impurity. Impurity. Is it pure? Lost and evil desires. Let's go on. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolatry. Greediness. You want to get rich fast, fast. You come to church, you lift up holy hands. You go back home, those boys begin to tell you about ways to get rich. And you are comfortable with that. Worshipping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Are we reading New Testament? Yes. Is this Old Testament? The, because of these things, the anger of God is what? Coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. Let there be a clear distinction. When you were in the world and now that you are in God, there must be a clear distinction. Child of God. You used to do these things when you were in the world. When I was in the world, there's a way I used to live. But now that I'm in Christ, there is a way I ought to live. When you were in the world, you were not a priest. At least not a priest of God. You became a priest when you became born again. That's when you became a royal priesthood, a holy nation. When you became born again. Now that you are born again, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. Now that you have become a priest, glory to God. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now, there is a but. But now is the time to get rid of hunger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. You see, I want to feel among that you're a priest, there must be a setting apart. People must see you and say there is something different about you. It says, and that's the language. Don't lie to each other. Should we even go there? Someone says, me, I don't fornicate. Me, I don't do all those things. But that lying. That lying. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all his wicked deeds. Put on what? Your new nature. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator, creator and become like and become like him. Become like him. The high priest himself. You know, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, when you, you want to do something, that would Jesus do this? Become like him. Let's go on because of time. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the only people he loves, can you see that? God chose you to be the what? Only people he loves. You must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I want you to see something. He says you must 
Did he say you ought to or you can or you? You must. Since God has chosen you, does it look like you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation? God has chosen you. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has chosen you. You are now a priest. And so you must, there are some things you must do because you are the chosen of the Lord. Since God chose you to be the only people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's fault and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love. Which binds us all together in perfect human, in perfect harmony. When there is sin in your life, your priesthood has sided with darkness, and your altar becomes perverted. And let me tell you something: the devil can actually take advantage of that sin. I don't know what anybody has taught you, but the devil can take advantage of that sin. You can't side with the devil. And at the same time, ignite your altar against him. You can't. You can't side with the devil. And at the same time, ignite your altar against him. Jesus was saying, he said, the prince of this world comes and he finds nothing in me. Nothing in me, nothing of himself in me. So the prince of this world came and he didn't find anything. Look at this. I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world came and had nothing in me. There was nothing of his that he could find in me. And somebody says that was Jesus. That was Jesus. But let me tell you something. You can do what Jesus did. You have the ability on your inside to do what Jesus did. Don't lie. <laughs> like my, my pastor will say, at least if you are going to be, at least if you are going to sin, be truthful. Don't say that you can't stop it. Ah, I must just sin. You see, I know I'm, I love the Lord, but when I see that boy, when I see that man. You know, when I get to work, I must just tell a little lie. Ah, pastor, you know, we just have to change something. The Bible already said it, that sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Sin cannot lord it over you. It cannot lord it over you. You have everything it takes to say no to sin. You have what it takes to say no to sin. You have what it takes. You have the precious Holy Spirit on your inside. You have what it takes to say yes to righteousness. Yes to holiness. Being sold out to holiness. You are a representative of the kingdom. And you should represent that kingdom well. You can't be a priest and side with the kingdom of darkness. You can't say your altar is of light and begin to side with the kingdom of darkness. God is calling us. To let go. Let's see John 14 30. Okay, we've seen that. Let's see, sorry, 2 Timothy 2 19. 2 Timothy 2 19. Look at this. Everybody, look at this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal. Is this New Testament? Yes, Are you sure? Yes. This is New Testament. Yes. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that as is. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ. Yes. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ. Depart from iniquity. Child of God, you're a priest. You have an altar.
And you must carry yourself in holiness. Departing from iniquity. You represent a God. And you must represent him for stand. Don't touch the unclean thing. God is raising for himself ambassadors. People that will stand for holiness. You know, I have so much to say. But because of time, so many scriptures here. Sin will bring you into spiritual manipulation whereby your altar will serve the devil in propagating his agenda. That's what sin will do. You will have an altar, but your altar will begin to serve the devil in propagating his agenda. Is that what you want? And that's what sin will do. But today, God is calling you. Those things, the ones that even your pastor does not know, but you know God knows it. It's time to separate yourself from that lifestyle of sin. General consecration. Come out from among them and be what? Separate. Come out from among unbelievers. Let there be a clear distinction that this is not an unbeliever. This is a believer. Household of CLC, God is call, calling us onto purging and cleansing. Don't touch the unclean thing. Don't touch it. And secondly, specific consecration. Specific consecration. And I'll round off on that. And then just do what the Lord told me to do. Let's see Luke 22, 41 to 44. Luke 22, 41 to 44. And he was withdrawn from thence about a stone cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou would be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I'm talking on specific consecration. There was what God wanted Jesus to do. But he got to that point when Jesus was about to do it. He got to that point And he did not want to do it. That's the truth. He saw all he had to go through. Everything played out in front of him. He got to that point where there was a conflict between his will and the will of God. And eventually he submitted to the will of God. An altar is a place of sacrifice where things are slaughtered. You slaughter your will, your desires, your aspirations and ambitions before the Father and you submit to his will. That's what an altar is. Consecration. Where you submit to his will. You have your own plans. You know this is what I want to be. Just like it was for me. When I was in school then, I was writing. You know, I was a writer. Prolific writer. I used to write satires. My poems used to come out in Tribune, colon 42, every Tuesday. They are still telling me about things. One professor like that in Obafemi Awolo University, a professor of literature, has started telling me about things. You can do this, you can work on this. 
And I would say, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be a writer. I had my plans. But God stepped in. And he asked me, I want to use you. Writing may be part of the plan, but that's not the original plan. I had to slaughter that on the altar that was my consecration, specific consecration. When there is a conflict between you and God and you ever win, you have won to your disadvantage and to your detriment. You have won to your own peril. And let me tell you this, whoever told you that doing God's will will be the easiest thing told you a lie. Following God's plan we just finished a series on following God's plan for your life, for those in CLC, will cost you something. And sometimes, you know, some of us even think that, okay, God should just tell me the end. You want me to be a minister? Okay, I will be a minister. That's not it. Your every waking moment, that specific consecration, he wants to be a part it's not just the end that justifies the means. It wants to be a part of the means. There's someone here. You've been planning. You want to travel out of the country. Thank you, Lord. You have it all planned. I want to travel out of the country. You have planned your life. And your parents have planned it with you. But I hear the Lord saying to you, that's not my plan. That's not my plan. That's not my plan. Don't fight with God. Don't fight with God. So let me tell you something today. When it comes down to what it comes down to, your life is not about you being great in front of anybody. It's about you being great in the sight of the Lord. Remember John the Baptist, what God said about him, and he shall be great in the sight of God. It's not about what anybody thinks about you. It's not even about what you think about yourself. It's about what God thinks about you. Wherever God sends you to, that is the north of your life. Wherever God sends you to, specific consecration. What is God telling you? And when it comes to specific consecration, you can have several. You know, when I was introduced, when I was celebrating Apostle, my husband, I told you about the guy that I loved. And God told me that that's not my husband. And I had to slaughter that relationship on the altar of consecration. These days, they've taught us it's not about God's will. Follow who you are attracted to. You put attraction force. If God is leading you to someone you are not attracted to, is it, you know, there are people that come to meet me in the office. They say things like, um, I've prayed about it. God is saying he's the one. Or I've prayed about it. God is saying she's the one. But I'm not attracted, ma. I just smile. You don't understand consecration. He chooses and everything aligns. 
everything will align. I was speaking to one of my daughters. I was speaking to one of my daughters, or a few of my daughters. I think Pastor Mimoyo and some of them. And they were talking, they were talking to me about relationship, and they were saying uh, that, ah, mommy, you know, God led you to daddy. Daddy that is, the, the, you, you said it now, that in school, daddy used to rough up. Daddy used to do this. Daddy that had swag. He would speak English. God led you to it. I was just laughing. <laughs> and I told them that, so, the, mommy, you now tell us now that God is leading us to one brother, one left leg, two left leg brother. We don't want, we want God to lead us to someone like daddy. That's the leading we want. And I was just, ah. <laughs> And I was just smiling, you know. And I told them, I got to a point in my life, and that's the truth, where my own will was just his will. I slaughtered what I wanted upon the altar of consecration. I didn't marry him. I didn't even see anything. That maybe it was anything. <laughs> you should trust me now if I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> I'm telling you. He's here, he's a witness. There was a particular brother. I know you people like stories. There was a particular brother that was coming to my room then. He would bring cooler, he would cook, he would cook rice inside cooler. My roommates will laugh. They will laugh. They couldn't stand him. He will wear, is it trailing? He was just, and I, I actually, because when he came to me, okay, God had told me, Apostle Mewa was my husband, but over one year, I didn't hear anything. So this brother came and was telling me the exact vision of Apostle Mewa. So I thought that, you know the prophetic sometimes that maybe Mugbegbagi or something <laughs> that you know, and the the everything God told me about Apostle. This brother came to tell me he's starting a work, he's doing this, he's doing that. But God is my witness. God is my witness. Even as funny as the brother looked then, with his cooler ministry, bring always bringing cooler to my room. He will make a four. And put it in cool. I'm telling you, Apostle is my witness. I'm telling you, he will make a fall and bring it to my room in cooler with his funny looking shoe. Then I asked the Lord, I asked the Lord, that Lord is it the one? I was willing. You see, after I left that my ex, I was willing to follow God wherever it was. I had no personal ambition. And I stand on God's altar to say this. God bearing me witness. I had no personal. Do you know that that brother, the way, you know, when he was telling me things, and then he was my pastor. Again, so I was thinking that, brother, you know, I'm a long gone and everything. And maybe he has had, you know, I began to talk to him. Began, my roommate would, my roommate, there then, my roommate would shout and everything. He's not telling me, he's not. I was, Let's just give it a chance. Wherever God says, I don't care whether it's, let's just do destiny together. Let's do ministry. Let's fulfill God's plan for our life together. I didn't care who he was. God himself had to encounter me. The brother started coming, started, started telling me all sorts manner of things that he saw me. God said, I'm the one, I'm some, some, something. I'm Mommy Gio in his church. I'm this one. He has, he has, he has, he has come me low me your bed. And me, I wasn't looking at the physical things. I was this purpose. Purpose was it was what purpose was the attraction. I remember that day I just slept in the afternoon. I came back from church, I'd gone to pray. I just came back, I was tired. I just lay down on the bed to sleep. As I slept, I just had a dream. I can never forget that dream. Those doing ETC, I've told them. I was, I was, uh, I've told you people, but for those I've not told. I was, I saw myself, I was walking somewhere to go and meet the brother. He was somewhere down. He was playing Ayo. How many of you know that Yoruba Ayo? He was playing Ayo with another, with a friend. 
and he was down there. And I was walking towards his direction to go and meet him. And then one girl, he, um, ah, he, 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 uh, that girl in CL, uh, CLF, yes, that said she saw vision. Yes, uh -huh. I saw her then. She just ran to meet me in the dream and said, ah, what wife? Ah, I now looked at her. I said, why are you calling me your wife? She said, ah, Pastor Muiwa. You see, this God there. Eh? How God kept me for Pastor Muiwa? Now, Pastor, Pastor, it's okay, it's okay. Pastor, it's okay, it's okay. God will keep you for your husband if you are not married. You like husband matters. No one under the sound of my voice will miss it. Do you like it this way? You are locked up in destiny. Wherever the brother is, you are locked up in destiny. As long as it's God's will. Wherever the sister is, you are locked up in destiny. As long as it's God's will. And she ran to meet me. You know? And she said, ah. And she ran to meet me and she said, ah, Pastor me, our wife. I said, Pastor me, what PM has told us that you are his wife. I said, PM. Say yes, he has told everybody that God told him that you are his wife. I said, and I've said in that dream, I've said yes to that brother. So when she now left, I was now walking. I now finally got to the brother's face. The brother was now telling the other friend that can you he hear the gist that is going on on campus? That Pastor Miwa is saying that his own wife is his wife. <laughs> that is, the other brother was now advising him. Indeed, I'm sure that was what could have happened that God showed me. The other brother was now advising him the dream that, that he is too calm and everything. That you should go and meet Pastor Miwa. You go and meet him and you, you would embarrass him. You would tell him that you should back off. Everything was now messy. Me, I now stood like someone that peed on her body in the dream. I was now wondering that, ah. And God told me that this Pastor Miwa is my husband. Though. If only I waited. Ah, now I've missed it. How do I rectify this error? I was now thinking in the dream. Ah, as I was thinking, I just started crying. I woke up with tears in my eyes. As I sat down, trying to process the dream, I had a knock on the door, it was the brother. <laughs> <laughs> now I've heard from the high headquarters. You know what Pastor your thought was this morning? I've seen, I've saw, I've been here. <laughs> I've seen, so I could see well. The eyes I gave him, I, gave him. I was, I said, I, I'm sure he was like, what, what happened to me all over? I said, I, I almost measured his name now. What are you looking for in my room? He was looking at me like, I said, I come here regularly. I said, please be going. The way I chased the brother away, it didn't take, I think, two, less than two weeks after that was when Pastor Mewa and I started talking. I said, this brother. But hey, back to my point. You would like stories. But back to my point, it was what God wanted. It was what God wanted. It was what God wanted. Don't wait till there is an impending accident before you give the will to God. That's what a lot of people do. They wait till there is an impending accident and they'll say, Jesus, come and take the will. Don't wait till there is an impending accident before you give the will to God. Give the will to God from the beginning. What is God asking of you? Remember, consecration is where things die and where things live. What is that thing you are struggling about? There's someone here. God has called you to ministry. And you have told God, the Lord, let me walk a bit. After my walk, let me just walk and settle down. I don't want to suffer. After my walk, I will come and do the call. God is speaking to you today. He said, I'm not next, I'm first. I'm not next, I'm first. That particular work you want to do, the Lord is asking you to slaughter it on the altar of your consecration. 
to slaughter it at the altar of your consecration. God is asking you to slaughter it at the altar of your consecration. God is speaking to your heart. What is that thing? That thing that you love so dearly. There's someone here. Thank you, Lord. You have planned it. The person I'm talking about you is a student. You have planned it that this is exactly what I would do after school. God is saying to you that that plan is not my plan. Let my plan stand. Let my plan stand. Let my plan stand. No rival throne survives. No rival throne survives. Let God take the wheel. Specific consecration. Not as you want it, but as God wants it. You want to settle somewhere. God says, no, don't settle there. Settle in this particular place. But they've been a struggle with the Lord. Let it go. Let that struggle go. Let that struggle go. Let God win over your life. Get to that point where you don't have any personal ambition. Your ambition is God. Whatever you want me to do is what I want to do. Wherever you want me to go is where I want to go. And like I said, it's not the end. It's even the means. Every day. What does God want you to do every day? Can God wake you up and say today you are not eating? Fast. Specific consecration as a priest. You want to watch a movie and God tells you, put off that TV and go to the place of prayer. Does that still happen in your life? Specific consecration. You want to sleep and God tells you, wake up, give me three hours. Does that still happen in your life? Specific concentration. We've spoken about two concentrations today. General concentration. Where you come out from among them and you are separate. That sin. Those, you know, your natural tendencies in the flesh. Where you slaughter it. Sin is not sweet. It's bitter. It will cost you so much. I don't care what you've been reading on Facebook. It will cost you so much. Rise to your feet. I want you to rise to your feet this evening.